All right. So, did a differential mass balance last time. Today, we're going to talk about doing a differential momentum balance. And remember, when we did an immersion momentum balance, we said that the sum of the forces on some control volume is equal to the change in momentum per time, the rate of change of the momentum, which is the same as just mass times acceleration. All right, and that's pretty familiar to us. So we have this little cube of fluid like we've had before, like we've talked about before, and we're thinking about the acceleration or the change in momentum on the tiny little piece of fluid, the infinitely small piece of fluid that is in one spot inside that volume. So for the acceleration on a piece of fluid, what could we use? Something that we have talked about in the past. Uh, material derivative. Material derivative. All right. We talked about the material derivative way back when. And y'all were like, what's the point of this? Well, one point is that that gives us, as I said, the acceleration, the material acceleration on sort of a piece of fluid. And we can say that multiply it by the mass of that piece of fluid and you get a sum of forces. So. So here, let's see, material acceleration, which we have covered in the past. And to get the mass inside the cube, we just take the density times the volume. And then we'll do the same thing we did when we did that differential mass balance, which is we'll divide by the volume, which is delta x, delta y, delta d, and then shrink the volume down to a point to get the, like this. So all we did is make that differential, okay? So all we are saying here is the sum of the forces on this is equal to the change in momentum. Just we've shrunk it down to a point. What does the DF mean? It's a it's not a DF instead of just sum of F. Uh, the sum of the differential forces. We we've yeah. Like, so the the differential forces poking at that tiny infinitely small spot. That's what that means. It happens it's like when small changes in forces shrunk down um, infinitely small the infinitely small changes in forces is just that is the force on this volume so we we took this here's our volume we there's all kinds of forces on it the net force is, okay so sorts there's some sort of net force on it but now we've shrunk it all down we divide by the volume, we do it as the volume goes to zero, and you get so it, the net differential force. So it simply means net force on this infinitely tiny. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, which means that if we had some sort of expression for it, we could integrate over everything and get a net force throughout our fluid, something like that. But that's what it is, it's that it is the net force on this differentially small volume, and we just get F is equal to MA, which is the same as F is equal to the change in momentum. It's the same as those momentum balances we did before. Okay. Now, uh, when we did the momentum balances before, we have on one side of the equation, we had the, the change in the momentum, which was M dot out, M dot V out minus M dot V in. 
Remember that, which was just about the, the momentum of the stuff going in and out. And then on the other side of our equation, we would set up the different forces, and then that would be our balance. Okay. So I just wanted to write this out then. Here's that material acceleration we had. And so X, Y, Z would look like this. I wouldn't write this down yet. We're not done. Notice that this is incompressible. In order for this to work for compressible flow, what would you, what do you think you'd need to do? Wouldn't density be inside the partial derivative? Yeah, density would have to be inside the partial derivatives. You'd have to have, you know, the density u, dt, and et cetera. You have to put the density inside the derivative if it's changing, right? Because it'll probably be changing as a function of x and y and z and u and v and all of this stuff. Okay. So that's that side of the equation, a side that just says the, the momentum change. The other side of the equation, we add up all the different forces that there could be. And there's a few different kinds of forces. One, all right, so we want all of these differential forces. So that's the forces acting on this volume. And then we shrink the volume down to zero and we get differential forces what sort of forces there could be. One kind is called body forces. So a body force is a force that acts on the whole, this whole cube at once. It acts on everything inside of there at the same time, acts over an entire volume. An example is gravity. And that's mostly it's gonna be gravity, but it could be something else. For example, what if you had some sort of um, plasma or some kind of electromagnetic fluid of some kind, and you had an electrical field that would be a body force, or you could have some sort of acceleration that isn't technically gravity, like this is on a spaceship or something, and it's accelerating. Point is, we're talking about gravity and gravity-like things. All right, so these body forces, which is called as M times G with a bar. The bar and the G means that this is a vector. It's just the acceleration vector for whatever your body forces are. We use G, but again, it doesn't necessarily have to be gravity, but it usually is. Okay. which again, M could be the density times the volume. And we divide by volume and shrink the volume down to zero, like we do to get this body force on this tiny fluid element. And it would look like this. All right, and there could also be stress forces. So the body forces acted on the whole thing. These stress forces, they're gonna act on the surface of this volume. And you could have normal stresses that act normal to the surface like these guys. And you could have shear stresses acting this way. Oh, I, I circled some wrong things. Okay, and then shear stresses acting this way. Okay. 
All of those stresses put together give you what's called the stress tensor. Tensors are collections of, if you have a collection of vectors, that's a tensor. And we're going to use, I'm using all appropriate notation for tensors and things. I'm not going to expect you to know some of this. As I said, we're going to get this into a form you're more familiar with soon. But right now I'm using the notation that's used for tensors. What's different between this and a matrix? A matrix literally just means um, a matrix literally it just those brackets and you put things in them, um, right? Uh, this, so for example, a vector uh, could have See, that's a vector, it's also in a matrix. And then this tensor is a vector of vectors. There's just, and so the thing you call matrix math and tensor math, it's just terminology here. All right, anyway, this is what we would call the stress tensor. And so for example, the force associated with this stress right here, to get that force, look at it, it's right here. So to get the force, you want to multiply it by the area of the surface, which would be delta y delta z. And if you divide it by the volume, which is delta x delta y delta z, you would get here. Okay, so now when we shrink the volume infinitely small, what do we get for the, the differential force from this? So quick question, are these sigmas just the amount of force going in that particular direction? They are the stress. These sigmas stress. are the stress. And what is stress? We've talked about stress before. We have, in fact, talked about stress before a lot, especially near the beginning of the class. We talked about what the definition of a stress is. Will someone tell me what the definition of a stress is? Is it just a force applied like across an area? Over an area in some way, right? Again, at the beginning of the class, and we talked about the difference between normal stress and shear stress. Remember this? I made you, I made you rub your hands together. Okay, force applied over an area, that's a stress. Can I ask a question? Yes. What's the difference between normal stress and normal stress and pressure? Okay, so most of the time, pressure is the normal stress we are worrying about. Okay, here because we're going to shrink down to a small part, you can also get some no normal stress from viscosity. But we're going to talk about it in a second. And good job remembering that pressure is normal stress. Um, how come in this thing where you divide it by volume, you still have x, f of x, x on the side? Uh, because I'm just taking the force associated with this stress right here, mm -hmm. which I've named like this, and it's this stress, and this is the face of the cube this stress is acting on. So to get force, that's the stress times the area. An area of that face it's acting on is delta y delta z. And I divided by volume. And remember, volume is equal to delta x delta y. Oh, you're asking why this isn't over delta v. Oh, yeah, that's fine. OK, cool. Sorry, misunderstood. <laughs> that's OK. OK, yeah, just put that over delta v. It's fine. Divide by the volume. And now we shrink it down, and what do we get? So in this case, if you're dividing by volume, why is it not a dv on the bottom of the dfx? Eh, maybe there could be. I don't, 
I did not think about that very much because that's going away, but. <laughs> okay, because like. Okay, all I'm, what I want here is just the, the four Corvette volume. We're not gonna, it's not gonna stay in there. So I did not think about that very much. This is, this is the part I want you to remember. All right, thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. I have a quick question. Yes. Is the delta that you have there, or whatever that uh, little symbol is, um, is that the same as a partial derivative? Yes, that little delta is a partial derivative, and I made it be a little delta there because it could be this this force here could be a function of lots of y or z or time even. It could be a function of loads of stuff. Okay, okay. that force could Thanks. be a function of y or z as well as x. Okay, all right. And mathemat and you could do that with all the other ones. And mathematically, it would just turn into this, which is uh, another tensor. What we get, and so when we add those forces together with change in momentum over there, we get the Cauchy momentum equation. This is why, as I said, I wasn't paying a lot of attention to what I wrote on the left-hand side. That goes away. What we get is change in momentum equals sum of forces. Mm. Okay. This is called the Cauchy momentum equation. You might want to just remember that name just and the most I would expect you to remember is that the name Cauchy momentum equation is the name for this momentum balance before we put in some specific things that is gonna turn it into what we call the Navier-Stokes equation. So this is just the very general momentum balance. What kinds of fluids is this valid for? Uh, this, yeah, this is the stress tensor we were talking about. All right, what type of fluids is this valid for? Newtonian fluids. Uh, no, actually, no, because we have not that the Newtonian fluids incompressible. This is valid for incompressible fluids. That's the only thing we've done yet. And you could make it be valid for compressible fluids by putting the densities sort of inside all of these. Okay. All right. This could work for non Newtonian fluids or anything. That's why it's super generic. But we need something useful for this, and so we take because we, oh, Dr. Nickerson. Yes. So we won't be doing calculations with the Cauchy momentum equation. No, we will not. Okay. All right. I, as I said, we're going to spend some time on the derivation here, and we're before we get to the actual form of the Navier-Stokes equation that you're going to use to do calculations. I want to show you where it comes from, and I want you to have heard the words Cauchy momentum equation in your life. So if you read it somewhere, it will, something in you will strike like a bell, and you will remember that you learned about that once. Okay. So we need something useful for this, and that stress tensor, you can say that those stresses come from the pressure. So the pressures are acting in the normal direction, all those faces, the pressure stresses, and then the viscous stresses. Is there such thing as a viscous normal stress? There is in this case. <laughs> we've shrunk this all down. So yeah, we're, we've shrunk it down to a point. So the viscosity can be dragging us up, down, this way can drag us in all the directions. And it just depends because it, and one reason why is, okay, this is actually the better explanation for that. So remember that the stress comes from, 
from the velocity, so like in a pipe, the velocity is going that way, the, the fluid is flowing that way, and the shear stresses are, they're shear to that velocity. Well, the velocity could be flowing any way through this thing, we don't know. There could be velocity flowing this way. So the fluid could be flowing like this through here, right? In which case, this stress that is normal to the surface of this volume I drew is shear to the direction of the flow going through it. All right, so there could be stress, viscous stress is acting any which way. So now we're gonna do this for a Newtonian fluid because we need to figure out what that viscous stress tensor is. So we know that the viscous stress depends on the shear rate which is the rate of change of the velocity in a direction. The 3D equivalent of that, again, not gonna spend a lot of time on this, looks like this. This is just notation for tensor math. But you should be able to see that we have the viscosity there and then this, which relates the, the change of the velocity in different directions. And I have a quick question. Yes related to those, um, the shear stresses. So I can see that the, when you did the, the pressure stresses, mm -hmm. then those were all the normals. Mm -hmm. But why do we, in what case would we have, um, or I guess, why don't we have zeros where the, on the diagonal there? Why, like, how would we have a shear stress that would be normal? Right. So we do not know what the velocity, what direction the velocity flowing through this little cube is. It could be in any direction, right? So let's pretend the velocity is going this way. So this is the direction of the flow is going up through here. And so if this is the direction going a flow going up through here, this stress, which this vector, which is normal to this box I drew, is shear compared to the flow. This box I flew, drew is not the same as the flow. Viscous stresses are shear compared to the flow and the rate of change of the velocity. And that wouldn't just come from the sigma yz and the sigma xz that are kind of on the sides also pointing up? It, nope, not necessarily because it will be affected by the way all of these velocities are changing in all the different directions. Right. So this okay. is just generic. It will work for however, however velocity depends on x, y, and z and whatever direction the velocity is through this point. It will work for all of that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. So as I said, this is this is how you would put that. Just wanted to point out that that's the continuity equation in there. We express it like this. Oh, and the steady state on, you end up with the steady state continuity equation, which for incompressible flow is zero. You end up with that. Again, that is vector notation. So this is the equation. In vector notation, this is the Navier-Stokes equation. So what we did there is we added in pressure and viscous forces for Newtonian fluids. So what kind of fluid did this work for? Incompressible. And what else? Newtonian. Newtonian. So I'll let you write this down, but on the next slide, it's gonna be in a form you're more familiar with. So when we solve problems, are we gonna be using this form or the next form? Okay, the next form is, it's the same as this, but you will be more comfortable with it. Okay, then. You'll, okay. you'll see when we go there. I'll just give you a second to write it down first. Um, so Dr. Nickerson, when we did the material derivative lesson, we did only a Dell operator without a bar above it. Was uh -huh. it supposed to be 
more like this, where it actually has a bar to, if you're using a tensor or? So I believe I have seen both ways. Okay. okay. Um, I believe I've seen both ways. So depending on the context, we'll kind of tell you what the Dell operator is actually supposed to be doing. Um, like whether, well, whether it's the Dell operator here is doing exactly the same thing as when we did the lesson on the material derivative. I don't know why I choose, chose to put a bar in on once and the other. It probably had to do with what book I was looking at at the time I made okay. the slide. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it, it works exactly the same. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. I got a quick question. Yes. I don't think I've ever seen the gradient um, squared before. Yeah. What exactly do you do with that? Okay, I will show you. You do this basically. It is, you'll, you'll see that there are second derivatives in there. That's, that's what it indicates. Okay. And this should make sense to us because remember viscous stresses depended on dv, dz or whatever. And so if you're going to take the derivative of those stresses, you should end up with second derivatives. So this is what I meant when I said I was about to show you this in a form you'd be more familiar with. This means the same thing as this. So this is just spelled out in Cartesian coordinates. So the main purpose of the Stokes equation is essentially given any flow field, you can generate a pressure field from it. That's probably like, like that's the most common use for it. Um, I would not say that exactly. Um, okay. The Navier-Stokes equation, it had, we are relating pressure, viscous forces, things. So I'm not sure most common is a word I would use, but that is a thing you can do. If you have a velocity field, you can generate a pressure field. Another thing we can do is for certain flow, for example, laminar, for certain simple flows, you can actually solve this in order to get velocity profiles. Did y'all wonder where velocity profiles came from? When I said, this is the velocity profile for laminar flowing around pipe, we are going to, we're going to do that. We're going to find that by solving this equation. Uh, my plan is for us to do that on Wednesday when we have a bit more time. What other uses will we have in this class for this equation? That's mostly what we're going to do in this class is we're either going to find velocity profiles or find pressure fields. Those are the two things I'm going to teach you how to do. And one of the reasons those are the two things I'm going to teach you how to do is those are, those are some of the only problems that are simple enough that you can do it by hand. But out in the world, the Navier-Stokes equation is extremely useful because look at this. Notice that we have, uh, we've got U, V, and W. So we have X, Y, Z velocity, and we have pressure. And there's a lot of situations where, so that's four unknowns, right? And there's lots of situations where we would like to be able to model velocity and pressure somewhere going through a pump around a car, whatever. So that's four unknowns. We've got three equations here. What is a fourth equation we could use? Continuity equation. Continuity <clears throat> equation. So add the continuity equation, which was EU for incompressible flow. And we've got four equations, four unknowns. And you can use that to solve things. And so in computational fluid dynamics, what we do is we take some kind of model or something, we divide it into bunches of little tiny cubes and we do a grid and we solve these four equations all over that grid and that allows us to simulate fluid. So this is the basic of basics of computational fluid dynamics. I told you that um, I've seen articles, video games, when they simulate flowing fluid, Navier-Stokes, they use Navier-Stokes. They use some tricks to simplify it down so they can do it fast, but that's how they do it. 
Now, I see that there's some discussion in the chat that Grant is being, uh, Legrand, sorry, is being very helpful with about that GX. So again, we put this just as a generic G so that it could cover anything, but most of the time, that's going to be gravity. So if gravity is significant, then GZ will be negative G, GY will be zero, and GX will be zero if gravity is significant. Okay, so for gravity, that's what it would be. But we put it in like this, so technically it could any, be any gravity like force. Also, you could. You can point your X, Y, and Z however you want, but this is a useful way to do it. By the way, the fact that this dp dx term is negative should also make sense to us because think about it if we have, think about our cube and we have P1 and P2. So if P2 is less than P1, that means that dp dx is negative. And what direction will the net force from the pressure be pointing? Okay, so P2 is less than P1 in that little thing I drew. We'll point to the right, like so. So if, so if dp dx is negative, the force from the pressure will be positive. That is why there is a negative right there. So with the, with the Navier-Stokes equation, basically you have on the left is the changes in the momentum mm -hmm. and on the right is the sum of the forces. Yep. Okay. Conceptually, that's what I want to know. And that is why we went through all of that derivation stuff because that is what I conceptually want you to know. I want you to look at this and not just think, ah, math. I want you to think on the left, we have change in momentum or MA and on the right, we have the sum of the force. I'll take an over volume and then shrink down, but yeah. Okay. All right, so here it is in cylindrical coordinates. And cylindrical coordinates are often useful for us because we deal with pipes a lot. And I check this. So I am 95% confident I didn't forget to include anything in this. So are we ever going to learn a version of this that works for non-Newtonian fluids? No. Well, I guess there's an exact problem in your book about blood that uses that uses some non-Newtonian model for it. And I, I don't know how different that is. I haven't really looked at it, but you could look at that if you're interested. I believe it's at the end of chapter. I haven't really looked at that example, so I don't know how complicated it is, but end of chapter nine, if you're interested in that. Mm hmm All right, so. I probably am not going to give you the time to write down all of this. It is in your book and it is in these slides which I've posted. Do write it down at some point. Also on a, in any exam, I'm going to give you this. I, I, yeah, I'm going to give you both of these written out on any exam that uses this. So I am going to move on, even though you probably are not done writing it down yet, to an example problem. 
like I said, I, I just put this one example here. And then the next example where we find a velocity profile, I moved to Wednesday. I'm thinking that should be better, but let's just start here. Okay. I gave you a 2D velocity field and I want you to find pressure as a function of X and Y. The first thing that we should do, the first thing we should always do is simplify the equation. I'm going to call on someone to give me an idea of a simplification we can do. Let's say, uh, Mitchell, Mitchell Blanchard, hey. What's that? Can you give me a simplification we can do to this equation, given what I've told you? Um, I'm not sure if I really understand the question. Okay, so our problem is we want to find a pressure as a function of X and Y. We're going to use Navier-Stokes to do this. We got to well, assume Newtonian. But we start with these three equations here. We want to simplify these equations, meaning we want to cancel things out. We want to cross stuff out. So what from these equations can we cross out? Um, the Z part of everything. The Z part of everything, because it's 2D. <laughs> like so. OK. Now, we don't know something else we can do. So this equation does not tell us what direction gravity is acting in. Conventionally, though, gravity acts in the z direction. So I'm going to go ahead and say we can assume Gravity is negligible, is zero or negligible. I'm going to say assume no gravity in X or Y directions. I know, I feel like that's safe. I think if they want you to have gravity not acting in the Z direction, they should tell you. So there we go. All right. So that's simplified. Uh, there's another simplification we can make. Let's see. Johnny, Johnny Pershing. There's another simplification we can make. What's What do you think? Let me think about this here. Um, okay. Read the whole problem statement, see all the words that are in it. Yes, yes, yes. Steady incompressible. Well, if it's if it's steady, I mean ah, never mind, never mind. No, no, no. You're good. You're um, good. You're oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can we can we can take out the um the um d velocity dt terms because it's steady, so it'll just be zero. Cool. Yes. All righty. Thank you. That is good. Okay, so that's what we've simplified this down to. And so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to write down what's left over after we did all that. Okay. Rho times u d u d x plus v times d u d y. I'm gonna do little little things when I'm doing these. Is equal to negative d p d x plus mu times the second derivative of u dx plus the second derivative of, 
of u with y. And then Right, so I wrote down everything we had left. And now I'll write down what u and y were. So u was aax plus b. And y was negative ay plus cx. So that means that the u dx is equal to what? Dr. Nickerson, just a quick question. Is that y that you put in the second thing, is that supposed to be v? Uh, which y? Um, in the, the second red equation that you wrote? That is supposed to be v. OK, sick. Thanks. My brain thought velocity in the y direction, and it wrote y. OK, so du dx is what? A. A. du dy is what? Negative A. Uh, du dy? That would just be 0, right? 0. Second derivative of du dx is? Zero. Zero. Because the derivative of a is a re with respect to x is zero. Same for this guy. Derivative of zero, zero. OK, e, v dx is equal to what? C. Yep, C. And the second derivative? Zero. Zero. And dv dy is equal to what? Is it negative a? Is that? Yep, negative a. And So then the second derivative will be zero. Zero, which means some more simplification can happen. By the way, essentially what we just said, what we just decided when we put this all in is that velocity is, um, or the change in velocity is constant. And so there's no, that's what we decided. Okay, so we did all of that. All that comes to zero. Some other stuff also comes to zero. That there we go. Um, Just really quick, can you post this recording when we're done? Indeed, I can, and also the notes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. This is why the simplification part is the key to these problems we're going to do. That okay. dy cancels too, right? Uh, D, D, V, D, Y. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, no, D, V, D, Y stays there. So now we plug in all of those things. I'm going to do a different color. 
Let's see. So rho times u, which was ax times b. Actually, I'm going to put rho over on that side. So we have ax plus b times du dx, which is a, is equal to negative 1 over rho dp dx, like that. All of the viscous stress stresses canceled out, like so. Good. And then the second one becomes u. ax plus b times dv dx, which was dv dx is c, plus v, which is ooh, negative ay plus cx times dv dy, which was negative a, negative 1 over rho dp dp dx. Do do. Let me see, this should cancel out at least a little, uh, or perhaps not. Um, okay. Wouldn't it be dp dy? Yes, that should be dp dy. And actually, maybe I shouldn't have put density over there. We do it a lot, but in this case, maybe it wasn't best. So we end up with dp dx is equal to ax squared plus ab and the times rho. I'll just put a row there. There's a actually, you know what? Yeah, so there's densities everywhere. Cool. And then let's see. P dy is equal to a C X plus B C plus A squared Y minus A C X. Oh, that's nice. Boom. Uh, I keep forgetting to do the density if it's over there, so I'll keep it there. And what we would do next is integrate. So that's how we would set it up. I will stay and we can integrate this if you'd like. There will end up being some things in it. Let's see. Yeah, all right, this is how we'd set it up. And then it's just a multivariable calculus problem. And then you have to change the, uh, I guess where'd the negative sign on the right side go? Does that mean you have, you have to then? Put that negative sign on. Oh the, yeah, you are correct. Right that negative sign needs to go somewhere. I'll just, I'll just keep it here for now. There we go. Okay. All righty. So as I said, if you want to stay on, we, I'll go through this. I can't remember if this is exact example from your book or something similar in, into it, but your book does have examples like this as well. Let's see. Okay, let's actually do this integration then. Ooh. All right, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to, I'll start with the x one. Someone who has written this down, once we get to the next slide, tell me what, what that was. It was something like negative 1 over rho dp dx is equal to what? A, a squared x plus a b. A squared x plus a b. That was it? Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to separate and integrate. So dp is equal to negative rho a squared x plus a b dx. So I'm going to integrate and I get p is equal to negative rho times one half 
a squared x squared plus a b x plus some function of y. Okay, the constant is a function of y because this is a multivariable problem and that was just a partial derivative. Okay, and then from the other side from y, we had negative one over rho dt dy. Will someone remind me what I have right there? Um, you have a squared y plus bc. A squared y plus bc. Okay, so again, all that stuff, the simplification part is basically what fluid mechanics is bringing to the table here. What we're doing now is a review of multivariable calculus. BP is equal to negative rho a squared y plus bc integrate P is equal to um, a one half a squared y squared plus b c y plus some function of x. I'm going to call it g because we did f for the other one. Okay, set these equal to each other. So we found P, those should both be expressions for P. I'm gonna set them equal to each other. Uh, oh, forgot about the negative row part, negative row, boom. So we should have negative row one half a squared x squared plus a b x plus function of y is equal to negative row one half a squared y squared plus bcy plus function of x. And so if I look at this, logically, it is clear that the function of y is going to be one half a squared y squared plus bcy. And the function of x has to be one half a squared x squared plus apx. So what I get is that pressure is equal to negative rho times one half a squared x squared plus abx plus one half a squared y squared plus bcy and plus some constant because there could be a constant in there. And we don't know. Ta-da. And you could simplify that down more probably, but there we go. Mm -hmm. so right. in, sorry, in order to find the velocity field, would you need to use a computer or is there a way to do that by hand too? So it, for order to find a velocity field. So let's say we, it depends on the setup. You need as many equations as you have unknowns. Um, so let's say you're saying like you know the pressure field, but you don't know the velocity. You have enough equations, enough knowns. There could be some situations where it would simplify out to a point where it's simple enough that you could do it by hand. Um, probably, I assume there's pro it's probably harder but what if I, for example, I know if we thought about it, we might be able to come up with something where you would set enough conditions that this would simplify out so you could do it by hand. It's doing the computer. What the computer does is it just iteratively solves, as I said, it, we take some volume and we cut it up into little pieces. Okay. And we set up those four equations for every little block in that volume, and then you just solve them all iteratively. And just most of life is 
and then you have to in order to and then you use boundary conditions to tell you what it is. So like maybe there's a surface there and by the surface, you know what the velocity is or you know over here that the pressure equals atmospheric pressure or something. And then you just have to use the computer to solve thousands and thousands and thousands of equations. There could be some situation where I gave you a pressure field and I made it be simple enough to, so you could do it to, on your own. I don't know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And then can you just go back to that very last, um, the very last part where we got the final answer? Okay, the final answer. Where did I write that? There, that, there we go. Okay, and then, um, so just going from that second to last line to the last line, mm -hmm. did you just find out what f, what f of y and g of x must equal in order for that to be true? So when I did those integrations, I got p is equal to blah, 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 and p is equal to blah, blah, blah. So what I got both times should be equal to each other if I set them together, mm -hmm. right? So those should both be, this guy and this guy should both be expressions for P. So they should be equal to each other. So I set them equal to each other. And when I looked at them like this, I said, okay, logically, if I look at this, F of Y has to equal this stuff and G of X has to equal this stuff in order for these to be equivalent. That's all. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, yeah. then I added another constant because there could be a constant. Okay. And that part could be more complicated than other problems. Is it because it's not always guaranteed that you would only have X's or Y's, but if, if not, you would still be able to solve. You would just have to maybe distribute things out and mm -hmm. find out what, um, what you'd have to have on each side, what extra Y's you'd need to have to equal the Y's on the other side. Mm -hmm. and so X's. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I was thinking that that's what you do, but then I looked. And so obviously this was set up in order to be a little bit simpler because as you're saying, there's no like X times Y terms in here. Oh, okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Which, see, for example, if like, if you had been X, Y plus B instead of AX plus B, when you did DU, dx, you'd end up with a y in there. And then other stuff would happen. I'm not sure. Uh, we could work it out, I'm sure, but um, it'd be more complicated than that. As I said, the what fluid mechanics is bringing to the table here is sort of teaching you how to set up the Navier-Stokes equation and simplify it. And then after that, it's calculus. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, we'll post these notes and the recording. See you later.